today, inshallah, we continue uh, talking about uh, ventricular septal defect. So last time uh, uh, we talked about uh, incidence of VSDs. We said this is a, a really common uh, disease. Again, a, a, bit, a part of lots of other uh, uh, cardiac malformations. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, anatomy, uh, anatomy of the uh, basic anatomy of the RV. Uh, features of the interventricular septum, uh, talked about uh, membranous septum and muscular septum, a membranous septum being divided into interventricular part and interventricular. Uh, talked about the relations of tricuspid to aortic and pulmonary valves and how, how a defect there uh, uh, would communicate between the ventricle and how, how would that be related to valves. Uh, talked about uh, types of VSDs. We said there are four types, perimembranous, uh, subarterial, inlet and muscular PSDs. Um, um, we discussed how, how we differentiate each type, so how to anatomically describe each one. Uh, how can you uh, differentiate them on echo, so which echo views can tell that which PSD uh, type. And talked about the relation uh, of each of them to conduction tissue. Um, briefly reviewed the, the pathophysiology of the VSD as a left right chunk. Uh, so, <coughs> today we'll go through the rest of the topics, so common associations, natural history for, for a VSD. So if a patient had a VSD and did not have any intervention, cardiac or cath, uh, I mean surgery or cath, uh, what would happen to them? And based on that, we talk about indications for closure, timing for closure, um, contraindications for VSD closure, uh, do we close it by surgery or cath? Techniques for surgical closure and results for that. So, uh, <coughs> so let's talk about common associations to VSDs. Uh, so, what would you think would be um, a common, a commonly associated uh, other disease to VSDs? PD, ASD. Oh, the BSD. Oh, the BSD. <laughs> okay, so uh, oh, so so some. Um, I think of them as some are are associated diseases. So patients are born with the two diseases, the BSD and something else. And other associations are actually secondary to the BSD themselves. So the the BSD caused another thing to happen. Okay. So, uh, as you said, uh, PDA is a common association. So, PDA is a communication between aortic and pulmonary arteries. Um, how, how do you diagnose PDA? By echo? Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> clinical and x ray. And so, but how, how would you diagnose PDA by echo? So you see color flow through the going from aorta to pulmonary. Or yes. Okay. Or Why would blood flow from aorta to pulmonary? Because the pressure in the aorta is higher than the pressure in the pulmonary. Yes. What if a patient has unrestricted VSDs? Mm -hmm. So the pressure equalizes between the RV and LV. And so the pressure is equal in the aorta and pulmonary. So now, now we have a patient who has equal pressures in aorta and pulmonary arteries. Mm -hmm. And then there will be no motive for blood to pass from one artery to another. Okay? At least not with a high velocity enough that can be detected by echo. Mm -hmm. So patients with unrestricted VSD causing significant pulmonary hypertension, mm -hmm. even if we put echo and have, uh, look at PDA, we might very well find no flow there. Although there is struct a structured communication between aorta and pulmonary, but there will be no pressure difference, so that we might not be able to detect significant flow from aorta to pulmonary or the reverse. Okay? So what do we do then? 
What do we do then? Again, the number is related to flow, so it's again the same. So any patient, any patient with a large VSD or any other cause for significant pulmonary hypertension, and then we're going for surgery to close the VSD, we routinely tie ligate the site of the ductus, regardless if it is patent or not. Okay? You frequently see on, on echo reports that PDA cannot be excluded because if the pulmonary pressure is high, there might actually be a, a PDA that we are not able to detect by it. Okay? So that's a limitation there. So, and, and since it is a common association, so we need, we need to think about that. If a patient has a VSD, there might very well be a PDA that can be missed because of the high pressure. So if we close the VSD by surgery, we just tie the, the site of the ductus. Okay. <coughs> a word co-optation is a common association, um, up to 10% of cases. So a VSD can be actually the cause for the aortic co-op. So um, aortic co-optation can, can occur because of, of different causes. So there are different theories there. One of them is the flow theory, where the, during fetal life, the flow across the distal arch um, is less than normal. So and a VSD can cause that. Okay. Obviously, a co-op can occur alone without the VSD, but, but this is uh, a common association. Uh, VSD can, can be associated with ASDs. Uh, if there is a VSD, this does not exclude that, uh, that there are other VSDs. Yeah. So you can get easily uh, a perimenous VSD and another mid-muscular or epitomuscular VSD. You can get multiple muscular VSDs. So how do you diagnose VSD? <laughs> by echo. And by echo, how do you diagnose that? Flow across it, exactly like the PDA. Mm -hmm. So if there's a big unrestricted VSD, what is unrestricted VSD? We don't respect the equalized So a VSD that is big enough so that it does not restrict blood flow across it. Mm -hmm. So unrestricted VSD means a large VSD, which allows equalization of pressure across both sides of the vessel. Okay. So if there is an unrestricted VSD, so a large VSD, that causes the pressure to equalize between right ventricle and left ventricle. And then there's another moderate size VSD near the apex. How would you detect that on echo? Maybe by scanning the septum. You scan the septum and all that view. So again, there might very well be no flow across it. Although there is, again, structural communication between the ventricles, but there is no flow because there is no pressure difference. Because the big VSD equalizes pressure. And then when you close the big VSD, you find another significant VSD after the patient has gone out of theater. Okay, so you should not. Uh, uh. Okay, with PDA, we just close the, yeah. the ductus. Then, why don't you just have a look at the septum and then close any other VSD? That's a different. Sometimes the VSD can be from the left side and you are working on the right side. Oh, okay. Remember last time when we saw uh, 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 images of the specimens of the RV? Mm -hmm. The RV is heavily trabeculated, mm -hmm. yes. lots of coarse trabeculation. Mm -hmm. And then any, any of these can have a VSD behind it. Mm -hmm. And then you cannot keep probing e everywhere and then you, you start, <laughs> you can really miss uh, significant VSDs, okay? So this is not a thing that we can routinely check inside the theater, okay? PDA can just ligate the ductal ligament regardless if it's separated or not, while VSDs has to be detected before. And then how would you detect before? You'll not be able to, to see it in theater? and surgery and now you're not able even to see flow because pressure are equal. So after, after I close I think the significant VSD, you do a So with all patients you close the big VSD and then come off bypass and then do a echo and then if you do not have the no, echo... No, 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 no. <laughs> you measure. You, you could measure pressure differences maybe with your... You have to get a good idea before surgery. And how would we do that? By echo, yes. but not necessarily by detecting flow. Yes. You scan the whole Septa. septum by 2D. Yes. And then you see if there is structural communication, a defect in the 2D image across the whole septum, apex to base, anterior to posterior. 
Okay? Yes. Finding a large VSD that explains the symptoms does not exclude the presence of others. Yes. This is a, a, a tricky thing to, uh, to detect. Okay, so these are um, um, associations. Patients were born with a VSD and something else. Okay? Others are sequelae that occurred secondary to the presence of the VSD. So, again, patients can get subaortic member, subaortic ridge, with VSD. And how would that happen? So, let's assume this is ventricular septum, here is a VSD. This is left ventricle, this is right ventricle. And then the left ventricle pressure will be high. So the, the pressure will, the blood will go across the VSD into the right side. So then if this is the, the ventricular septum, and blood keeps hitting the crest of the septum, keeps hitting the crest of the septum, and then a fibrous ridge occurs here. And this causes more blood to hit that, and then more and more growing ridge, till it forms a proper subaortic member. So, subaortic membrane is a common association to VSDs. Patients are not born with subaortic membrane. It is progressive, and the VSD might very, the flow across the VSD might very well increase this, uh, this subaortic membrane. Okay? Is it possible that sometimes you see the subaortic membrane and the VSD got closed off? Yes. The membrane, and, uh, and all that is left is the membrane? So, uh, VSDs, we'll talk about that in natural history. VSDs can close spontaneously. And then if a uh, subaortic membrane occurred before that, then the VSD might very well close, and then you leave the membrane, and then the blood coming out of the left ventricle into the aorta will keep hitting the membrane, and then the subaortic membrane will still progress. Okay? So yes, the subaortic membrane is, a, is a something that can, that can happen with VSDs, usually not very early on. <coughs> So remember talking about types of VSDs, and then we said there are some VSDs that are that lie just below the aortic uh, valve. Yes. So at least three types of VSDs can occur below the aortic valve, which is the subarterial, which is part of the edge of the defect, reaches the annulus of the aortic and pulmonary valve, and the perimembranous VSD, again part of the edge of the defect, reaches the annulus of the aortic and the tricuspid valve. So the aortic valve has a part that is not supported by muscle. And there's a defect there that causes blood to go from left to right. So this keeps pulling on the, on the aortic cusps with the venturi effect and the lack of support. This, is, this usually happens more with the subarterial VSD and then perimembranous. So the cusp can prolapse into the VSD and then this causes more blood to push it, and then causes more and more collapse, and this can eventually lead to aortic regurgitation. And this aortic regurgitation is progressive; it keeps going on. Okay, the patients can get severe aortic regurgitation caused by aortic cusp prolapse, and this cusp prolapse is caused by the lack of support and the venturi effect of the VSD. Please explain more about So the venturi effect is blood going through the VSD and sucking tissues inside it, with it. So if the, the aortic cusp is just above it, it gets sucked into the VSD. This causes the VSD to become less. So the, sh the shunt across the VSD gets smaller. Patients can get restricted VSD, although the, the actual size is big. And this restriction is caused by the, cusp, the aortic cusp sitting inside the VSD and restricting blood flow in it. But this is not, this is not what, uh, how you want the VSD to close, by destroying the aortic valve in a kid. Yeah. So, so does the venturi effect only apply for VSD in that setting, or can happen with a VSD in the tricuspid valve? It usually happens with the, because it has, the blood goes from left to right, and then it keeps the blood from, from left to right. Uh, so, Subaortic membrane, aortic cusp prolapse, aortic regurg. Remember talking about the subaortic membrane where the blood hits the crest of the septum, causing fibrous ridge. On the other hand, when this blood crosses into the right ventricle, it actually hits the RV wall. 
and this causes muscle hypertrophy and fibrosis in the right ventricular absolute tract. To the extent it, cause, uh, it co can cause RVO tube obstruction, and this obstruction can be tight enough so that it separates the right ventricle, divides the right ventricle into two parts, one with the VSD with high pressure, and then a part above it with lower pressure because RVO tube obstruction causes high pressure, pressure gradient from the RV to the pulmonary. In a sense, this protects the pulmonary circulation from the high pressure. So for the patient, this is, might be a, a good thing, a protective thing. But on the other hand, if you're doing intervention for the VSD, you cannot close the VSD and leave the obstruction. Then you have to, to think about that. So VSD can be associated with PDA. This can be easily missed if the, v, the VSD is big. We routinely like in the VSD, uh, the PDA if we're doing the VSD closure surgically. Aortic rotation can happen. Uh, ASDs, other VSDs. Again, other VSDs can be missed. Has to be detected by 2D echo rather than flow. Color dot. And um, other associations are actually probably secondary to the VSDs, like the subaortic membranes, aortic ridge, aortic cusp prolapse or regurge, and RV tube obstruction in double chamber. So again, in, in congenital, anything can happen with, with anything. That's why you go systematic and check everything. But um, lots of congenital uh, defects are commonly associated with others. And that's why if a patient has a VSD, I put a checklist in my head and then keep excluding common associations. <coughs> so now, uh, uh, this is the image. We're looking from the left ventricular side. So this is left ventricle. This is aorta, uh, coronary ostium. And then you can see the VSD, and you can see uh, the subaortic ridge. Uh, this is the image where we're, we're looking through the right ventricle. So this is an incision in the, in the right ventricular free wall. So this is ventricular septum. This is a VSD. So if I, if I go inside, this is left ventricle. The, left, the, the septum should have been like that, and this is pulmonary valve, okay? And now you can see a VSD, and this is a aortic cusp. So th that's a subarterial VSD, where there's a communication between the annulus of the pulmonary and aortic valve, and they form together part of the, the upper edge of the defect. So you can see how that the aortic cusp is, is actually collapsing inside the VSD and not supported. This is by injecting blood into the aortic root, so this is blood filling the, the aortic cusp. You can see how the, the cusp is nearly closing the VSD, but actually very prolapsing inside it. Obviously, you can think that this causes regurgitation of the aortic valve. Okay. This is an, uh, uh, an echo view for patients with the VSD with aortic cusp prolapse. So this is parasternal lung axis, left atrium, left ventricle aorta. This is RVOT. And then, these are auto cusps. This is actual VSD. And this, this is closed by the auto cusp itself. So the auto cusp should have been there. It is sucked inside the VSD, nearly closing the VSD. But you can see that this cusp lies much lower than this one. Okay? And then when you see a, a color, you can see that there is a vertical gurge, and the vertical gurge goes away from the prolapsing cusp. Okay? Can you see that the pulmonary valve is just uh, uh, at the, the level of the aortic valve? This is probably at a sub arterial TFC. <coughs> so that's a patient with the VSD and RVT obstruction. So uh, here we're looking through the, the inlet and apex of the RV. So here, here's the cusp valve of the apex. This is a VSD. And this is the only way where blood can flow into the pulmonary valve through the RVOT. So muscles have hypertrophy and with fibrous tissue and then restricting flow the so this area of the VSD of the RV has high pressure. While on the other hand, if we look from above, the, this is pulmonary valve, and this is the only uh, opening where blood can pass from this high pressure chamber 
into this lower pressure chamber of the RV. If they call that yes. double, double chamber right vent. Obviously, this has nothing to do with double outlet right vent. That's a totally separate disease. So double, double chamber right ventricle is like a mid ventricular obstruction of the right ventricle, like causing RV obstruction. They call that uh, osteum fibula, where it's very narrow, like an um, like, um, osteum for the mouth. <coughs> so again, echo views showing a uh, uh, sim uh, similar patient. So this is parasitic short axis, left atrium, right atrium, left atrium septum, tricuspid valve, pulmonary valve would be here. This is uh, aortic valve uh, short axis. And then you, can you see the uh, color flu yes. across the septum? What type of VSD is that? Where is the tricuspid valve? It's ne next down. The tricuspid valve is there. Yeah. Is the VSD reaching the tricuspid valve like this? No. No. Where is the pulmonary valve? Red. Here. Yeah. Oh. Does that reach the pulmonary valve? No. No. So it's not a premium mess? And not subarterial? Yeah. What, what are the VSDs that can be viewed in this image? Muscular VSD, and then where, where in the muscular septum? Outlet. 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 outlet again. So this is a, a muscular outlet VSD, outlet muscular VSD. So in this view, you can either see a perimenous VSD, a subarterial VSD, or a muscular outlet VSD. So this this one is an outlet muscle VSD. Okay. And then, then you can see blood going from the RV into the pulmonary with obstruction. So this is a VSD that caused RV obstruction similar to the double chamber right ventricle. So this area is high, high pressure, while that area is lower pressure. So PDA, ASD, coarctation, other VSDs, subaortic membrane, aortic cusp prolapse regurge, RV obstruction. <coughs> So, what happens if we leave a patient with a VSD without any intervention? So, more than half of the patients with VSDs will have their VSDs closed spontaneously, and this usually happens with the muscular and the perimembranous VSDs. So that's a that's a nice thing. It looks like a very benign disease. So nearly. 60% of, of VSDs will close spontaneous. That's good. Um, if the VSD will close, it usually closes within the first two years of age. Okay? Patients who uh, cross two years of age with a VSD, the likelihood of the VSD closing is um, a lot less. <coughs> On the other hand, like one sixth of patients will develop heart failure during the first six, of, six months of life. And many of these will die if the VSD is not closed. They die of failure very early on. This is not the increasing pulmonary vascular disease and Eisenmenger and things. They die of, of high, high flow, chest infections, uh, heart failure. So, so, and this occurs quite early, like six months of age. Okay? <coughs> On the other hand, if, if patients survive this period, they get significant increase in pulmonary vascular resistance. At first, it is uh, reversible, and then it turns into becoming irreversible. So patients with a big left-right shunt, causing high pulmonary fluid, high pulmonary pressure, causing significant increase in the pulmonary vascular resistance, and then this increase in pulmonary vascular resistance becomes irreversible, Till the shunts reverses, becoming right to left. So we call this situation Eisenmenger syndrome. Okay. So irreversible pulmonary vascular disease can occur in unrestricted VSD, usually after two years of age. Obviously, there are no cutoff point um, for all patients. Some patients can develop significantly earlier, and some patients can stay very long time without, without developing that. But the, most patients develop within two years of age. Some patients like the, the Down syndrome can develop irreversible increase in the pulmonary vascular uh, uh, resistance 
significantly earlier, as early as six to nine months of age. So if a patient develops Eisenmenger syndrome, <coughs> their survival can be as, as high as 50% after 20 years. What happens if we get a patient with irreversible pulmonary vascular disease, so Eisenmenger syndrome, established Eisenmenger syndrome, like at three years of age, and then we close the VSD? <laughs> They die of RV failure because now the RV is facing a huge uh, resistance. And so this causes the blood to go from right ventricle to, to left ventricle, so pulmonary to systemic, causing some cyanosis. If you close that VSD, the RV will have to face all that resistance and cross, uh, push the blood against this really, really high resistance and needing to generate really high pressure. And this right ventricle just fail. Okay? So, Patients with Eisenmenger syndrome who have their VSDs closed might very well die in theater on table or get RV failure very early on later. While if we leave them, they can survive, like 50% of them will survive as long as 20 years of age. So on the other hand, patients with small restrictive VSD that is not hemodynamically significant, I mean without increasing pulmonary artery pressure, without LV dilatation, they still have VSD. But this VSD is not hemodynamically significant. These patients survive as long as the, the rest of the normal population. So they have normal survival. Okay? <coughs> Five percent of patients can develop um, aortic valve prolapse or urge, usually the, the subarterial or the perimenus. And um, there's a small risk of developing infective endocarditis because of a VSD. It's about 0.2 percent. Why is it important to know the natural history of a disease? Management. Because then you see patients who don't do well. Um, you, you try to improve uh, their outcome, while patients who do not suffer of anything and have normal survival with a risk of endocarditis that is actually not much higher than the endocarditis following surgery, and then you would just leave them. Because we do intervention, surgery or cath or anything, to improve patient outcome. If the patient outcome is equal to the normal population, you just leave them. Okay? Yes, and that's why we think indications after we know the natural history. So again, a VSD can be a very mild, benign disease, and like a lot of, of the VSDs can grow spontaneously, okay? Usually within first two years of life. On the other hand, it can be a significant disease that causes significant morbidity and mortality. Uh, patients can die of uh, heart failure, can develop irreversible uh, pulmonary vascular disease uh, and then they do bad. Uh, patients with very small VSD that is not hemodynamically significant survive as long as the normal population can develop orticus prolapse and a small risk of developing endocarditis. <coughs> so what are the indications for VSD closure? Uh, I want to highlight an, an, uh, an important idea here. In the, in the lecture of the VSD, there is a topic called indications. <laughs> <laughs> what are the indications for surgery in hello? The diagnosis is indication for surgery. Yes. What are the indications for surgery in PGA? The diagnosis, diagnosis is indication for surgery. What are the, the indications for surgery in AV canal? The diagnosis. What are the diagnosis for surgery in the trunk? Again, okay. Well, the VSD is not. Patients just having a VSD, this does not mean that we have to do something because some of them will, will have outcomes similar to the, to the normal population. 
okay? So, <clears throat> any patient with unrestricted or symptomatic VSD has the VSD to be closed, okay? Uh, I'm talking now about indications for closure. I'm not talking now about timing. So, indications is one thing, timing is another thing. Now we're talking about is that VSD um, that needs closure or not? Does it need closure or not? So any unrestricted or symptomatic VSD has to be closed. What if the patient has a, as a restricted VSD, so there is a pressure drop across it? We have to um, uh, make sure that this VSD is hemodynamically significant. How would you know that the VSD is hemodynamically significant? Okay, so there's a, a lot of pulmonary flow, and so pulmonary flow will be much higher than systemic flow. And then the ratio between pulmonary flow and systemic flow will be high. What is the ratio between pulmonary flow and systemic flow? QP over QS. QPQS is the ratio between pulmonary and systemic. What's the normal ratio? What's the normal QPQS? One. Why is it one? <laughs> So, so we'll discuss that in the, in the lecture on positive physiology. So because circulation, we have two circulations that go in series. So all the systemic venous return has to go pulmonary, both the pulmonary uh, venous return has to go systemic. So even if, if there is an area of narrowing, the blood will have to, to wait. So again, the flow in both circulations should be equal, so long that there are no shunts. But if there is shunting, blood can choose where to go. So it can go a lot more into pulmonary than systemic. So normal QPQS is one. Patients with significantly higher QPQS means they have significantly higher shunting. Okay. How do you measure QPQS? So okay, you can read by cathode MRI. Okay, so, so can be done by echo. But the echo is very, very inaccurate um, measuring QPQS. So uh, uh, it's a lot more accurate doing that by MRI or cardiac cath. Cardiac cath is the gold standard, but the MRI is an uninvasive thing. And, uh, uh, and, and again, uh, they are very comparable in detecting QPQS. So does that mean that any patient with a VSD has to have a cath no. or MRI to detect QPQS? No. no. Why? Because there are other parameters you can use to tell. Okay. So, does it make any difference if the QPQS is 2 or 2.2 or 2.5? It, it's different as in symptoms will be the same. So, I do not have to know the exact number. Yes. I just have to know if the pulmonary flow is significantly increased or not. So if we have other parameters like dilated LV or increased peer pressure, and then I have, I have another science telling that there's significant increase in pulmonary blood flow in relation to the systemic blood flow, okay? So patients with restricted VSD, I mean significant uh, gradient across it. So these patients do not have um, uh, pulmonary artery pressure which is equal to the systemic. Okay, but can be slightly elevated. On the other hand, not having pressure load does not mean that you don't have volume load. Patients with ASD have significantly increased pulmonary blood flow without having pulmonary hypertension initially for a very long time. So patients with restricted VSD can still get significant volume load. Okay. So any unrestricted or symptomatic VSD are in the patient. Patients with restricted VSD, I need to get a sign of increased pulmonary blood flow like dilated LV, increased peer pressure, or if I'm in real doubt and the, num the, the LV is just high normal or patient is not very symptomatic and I'm, I'm really thinking about the VSD looks significant on echo, then we can do cath or MRI to measure actual numbers for QPQS. If it is more than 1.5, then this needs closure. So for the restricted VSDs and dilated LV, we do disease cause. Yeah. 
without actually measuring the size of the LPM score between the high temperature. Yes. As she did the work of the uh, let me tell you a story. So there's a patient who has six months of age. And then a pediatrician heard the murmur, sent him for echo. And then found, uh, echo showed that there's a subarterial VSD uh, with aortic cusp prolapse. Uh, the aortic cusp is uh, closing most of the defect. So the flow across the VSD is, is very small is restricted. The VSD size itself is big, but the cusp collapse is closing most of it. So the, now the flow across the VSD uh, is restricted. The LV is not dilated, and there's barely any aortic converge, like trivial aortic converge. So, um, uh, so uh, someone uh, told him, okay, now you have a, a very restricted VSD. You do not have high peer pressure. The LV is not dilated. And the aortic valve has trigger reverse. And then that's not good. Okay, just go, follow up, and come back. Uh, patient comes back at one and a half years of age. Uh, repeat echo. Again, patient is asymptomatic. The LV is not dilated. Uh, the, uh, the VSD is still restricted. The, the peer pressure is low. Uh, the aortic reverse is mild to moderate. So, again, someone told them, uh, okay, the VSD is very restricted, the LV is not dilated, uh, the, the patient is asymptomatic, and uh, mild to moderate aortic regurg is not a strong indication for, for surgery. Uh, so, so if a patient has like rheumatic heart disease with mild to moderate aortic regurg, you don't know anything. So just go follow up and, and there's nothing, okay? Have you read this? <laughs> <laughs> Comes back at three years of age. <laughs> now the patient is symptomatic. Now the LV is dilated. Not dilated because of the VSD. It's dilated because of severe aortic reverge. Okay? So now the patient has a strong indication for surgery. He has severe aortic reverge. LV dilated. Symptomatic. Now what should we do? So send him to surgery, close the VSD, and do aortic valve surgery. What aortic valve surgery would you do for a three-year-old three year child? Okay, we try doing repairs and resuspension for cusps, or, but uh, uh, just uh, uh, mind that patients with significant long-standing aortic regurg get secondary changes. So okay. significant cusp prolapse keeps pulling more and more on the cusps and causes secondary chains into the cusp tissue. So it, it is no, more, no longer normal. Mm -hmm. So repairing um, severe aortic regurg because of long-standing aortic cusp prolapse can be very difficult and might not um, uh, be very well successful. Okay, so we just replace the valve. So what valve size would you you'd put for, the, for a three-year-old? So you cannot put a mechanical valve there because again it would be very small. The patient will grow and the and the okay. So we do Ross operation. So so the, so the Ross operation is the is a really big operation where you take the pulmonary root and implant that on the aortic root and then you put a homograft from the RV to the pulmonary. Root. That's a really big operation. Okay, uh, significant number of of. Pediatric cardiac surgeons are not very comfortable doing this operation. Okay? It's a subarterial VSD. The conus is deficient because part of the edge of the defect reaches the pulmonary annulus. So there is no pulmonary route that we can take supported to put in the on the aortic side. So even the rust is not a is not an option here. And now this is a really big dilemma, this is a really big problem. Patients with VSDs and cusp prolapse get their VSDs closed, do not wait aortic regurgitation to happen. Okay? Yes. Any cusp prolapse with any degree of aortic regurgitation get the VSD closed. VSD closure is a really uh, uh, easy operation here. 
well, a wound valve surgery in a in a child is a big problem. Okay. All patients with inlet or subarterial VSD get the VSD closed. Because if a patient has an inlet VSD, he also has a, a com has a complete canal. So there's a common AV valve and cleft my left AV valve. So uh, the, the cleft AV valve and the common canal do, do not resolve spontaneously. Okay. While subarterial VSDs, again, usually they do not close spontaneously. And if they close, they close with aortic cusps, which we do not want. So subarterial VSDs get the VSDs closed. <coughs> So we said, patients who have small VSDs have a small risk of infective endocarditis. So the rationale of closing any VSD because it can cause um, endocarditis is, a, is a not a good um, uh, argument there, because the risk of endocarditis following surgery might very well be um, equal or higher. So we do not close this prophylactically. But if a patient develops infective endocarditis on a VSD, then we close that VSD. Okay, so we treat the endocarditis till it's better, and then uh, get the VSD. And obviously, any patient doing any other cardiac surgery will not just say, "Okay, this VSD is closed; uh, it's small; it's not indicated." And then we do the other. If if we're inside the heart, we close the VSD, regardless uh, of any other indication. So, indications related to um, uh, size and amount of something. Indications related to type of VSD and associations, or complications like endocarditis or any other cardiac surgery. Unrestricted VSDs, restricted with significant chunking, any aortic cusp collapse or urge, inlet outlet VSDs, infective endocarditis, and other causes of cardiac surgery. Again, this slides mean if a patient has a small VSD that is not hemodynamic and significant, with no association of aortic cusp prolapse or urge, and no endocarditis, these patients should just be followed up because their survival is equal to the normal population. Okay. So, we have a doctor in my country who insisted on his having surgery, and my center declined, so we flew the child to India. Okay. So we talked about indications for VSD closure. Now we talk timing. So if a patient has a VSD, which is so a patient, uh, uh, so you get an echo report from a colleague saying that uh, this patient has uh, uh, one week of age, and now he has a four millimeter VSD with left to right shunt and pulmonary artery pressure of fifty. What would you do? The pulmonary pressure is high. But it's uh, it's one normal. Week. It's normal for one week. Or so <laughs> patients with so during fetal life, the pulmonary artery pressure is high because the pulmonary vascular resistance is high. Okay, because of the lung being collapsed, compressing the vessels and. Uh, uh, Inhaled oxygen is a really potent pulmonary vasodilator, while in fetal life there is no inhaled oxygen. And so mm, the, the fetal circulation, the pulmonary circulation is in a state of positive oxygen. So during fetal life, the pulmonary artery pressure is high. Uh, on birth, there is a sharp uh, decrease in the pulmonary vascular resistance because the lung expands, uh, the baby inspires oxygen, and then pulmonary vessels uh, vasodilate. And then there's a sharp decrease in the pulmonary vascular resistance. But it does not reach its adult level till like six to eight weeks. So for six to eight, the first six to eight weeks of life, uh, patients have slightly higher pulmonary vascular resistance, so higher pulmonary artery pressure. So it's a normal to get higher pulmonary artery pressure in the first few weeks of life. Okay? So having a patient with pulmonary hypertension in the first week of life means just nothing. Okay, so you follow that patient up, for, uh, another echo after three months. So at three months of age, uh, VSD is still left to right, but now the gradient across the VSD is 60. 
what does that mean? Restricted. It is restricted, which means that the pulmonary pressure is less than the systemic by 60. So, which means that the pulmonary pressure is low. If the, if the, if the systemic pressure is 80, then the pulmonary pressure will be 20. What would you do then? Follow up. Follow up. He keeps following up, and then at two years of age, the patient has no more BSD. So, wh what should have we done? No. Nothing, just follow up. Okay? Another patient who is <coughs> um, four months of age, uh, BSD, left right shunt, unrestricted, baby is asymptomatic. What do we do? <laughs> Sorry? Intervene. Intervene. Four months of age. Four months of age. Why, why don't we just wait? Maybe he can uh, get the VSD closed uh, spontaneously like the other patient. Four months of age is already, you said it's symptomatic. There is a significant risk of patients developing heart failure with actually a risk of mortality during the first few months of age. We should not wait on unrestricted VSDs. So, but again, we do not close that the first few weeks because still the symptoms are not very high because of the pulmonary vascular resistance restricts the shunting. So patients with unrestricted VSDs get their VSDs closed by three to six months of age. So not very early because still pulmonary vascular resistance is still high, you get given them some time. And then, uh, but not later because then you can get significant risk. While on the other hand, patients with restricted VSDs you wait, follow them up, because they might very well uh, uh, have the, the chance for the VSD spontaneously closing, or actually not totally closing, but becoming very restrictive, so that it becomes hemodynamically insignificant, and then they get the survival like the normal people. Okay? So you wait for like two, three years of age, because then after that, the, the chance of the VSD spontaneously closing gets very low. And then if it is still significant after that age, you get the VSD first, okay? Any patient with, with any degree of aortic cusp prolapse or regurg, they get the VSDs closed at once. You do not wait for two, two three years because then the aortic regurg can progress very, very much. So timing of VSD closure depends on um, uh, the size of the shot and if, if there is significant association. So now we talk about when do we need to, what are the indications for VSD closure? And then what is the proper timing for the closure of the VSD? When would we say that we should not close the VSD? So contraindications for VSD closure. Small restrictive. Small restrictive is not reaching indication. But now I mean there is a significant VSD, but that we should not close. Eisenmenger. Again, patients with Eisenmenger syndrome, if they get their VSDs closed, they do significantly worse than just leaving them. Okay? So we said that the median survival is nearly 20 years of age with Eisenmenger, while closing the VSD of Eisenmenger can have really high mortality, perioperative mortality, or significant morbidity later with RV failure. So, uh, Contraindications here are um, uh, essentially the development of uh, irreversible pulmonary vascular disease. And how would you diagnose pulmonary vascular disease? Right heart cath. So you get any patient with VSD and do warrant heart cath to, develop, to diagnose pulmonary vascular disease? Oh, okay, we start clinically. We start clinically, okay. So clinically, the, the symptoms should come Okay, down. so patient age. Uh, what's the likelihood of patient being Eisenmenger while at four months of age? Nearly zero. Yes. No, there's, there's nearly no chance. While uh, if the patient is like four years of age with big VSD, there's a big chance for, for him to, be, to have pulmonary vascular disease. So patient age is an important thing. History. So if a patient has significant uh, symptoms of heart failure, recurrent chest infections, failure to thrive, and then, then started gradually getting less symptoms of heart failure, and then started gradually uh, uh, detecting cyanosis. And so that's, that's a significant history. So, so patient reporting cyanosis is one thing, and 
checking pulse oximeter and detecting actual oxygen saturation is another thing. Okay, so do not check oxygen saturation. Patients with azomenger will get saturations of low 90s to 80s. Uh -huh. Chest X-ray. So oligemic. So patients with VSD, unrestricted VSD, they get cardiomegaly, blethora, big pulmonary shadow, signs of dilated uh, left atrium left ventricle on X-ray. On the other hand, patients with Eisenmenger, they get oligemia, so the X-ray is oligemic. The cardiac shadow gets smaller, because although the, the right ventricle is hypertrophic, hypertrophy does not cause cardiomegaly. Okay? Like patients with aortic stenosis, they do not have big hearts. Okay? So smaller cardiac shadow, oligemia, while the pulmonary artery shadow will still be big. Then you do ECG. And then you see signs of RV enlargement, RV hypertrophy with strain. You do echo. What do you detect in echo of an Eisenmenger? So big VSD. You detect big VSD with unrestricted flow. Um, the flow across the VSD can be bidirectional or maybe purely right to left. Pulmonary artery pressure can be estimated on echo and then you, this should be high. Tail view would no longer be dilated. Well, the RV would be hypertrophic. Then you do right back cath. Okay? You should not label a patient as an Eisenmenger without doing cardiac cath. Because, okay, things are common, but we frequently get surprises. We can get really old patients, 17, 20 years of age, with unrestricted VSD and they're still reactive. So, what would you do in CAS? Okay. Pressure. So, so just measure pulmonary artery pressure, and detect that the pulmonary pressure is actually really high. That that like we're estimating, and then uh, reversibility. So patients can get a um, high pulmonary artery pressure because of either high flow or because of the increase in pulmonary vascular resistance. And this increase in the pulmonary vascular resistance can be either because it is um, the pulmonary vessels are vasoconstricted or because there is irreversible increase where actually permanent damage has occurred in the pulmonary vascular bed. So, so we need to know which, which category are, uh, is every patient there. So to detect reversibility, we give potent pulmonary vas dilators. So, so the most potent thing that we know of that works quick enough, uh, so because you want to do the study, measure before giving the vas dilator, and then give vas dilator and measure immediately after. So the most potent thing is nitric oxide. Um, 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 some countries do not have access to this. And then um, uh, the easier thing would be giving 100% oxygen. So putting the patient on a ventilator and giving 100% oxygen. Measuring before and measuring after. <coughs> what do you think will happen if we give a potent pulmonary vasodilator and the pulmonary vascular resistance decreases? So, would you find lower pulmonary artery pressure? Would it still be high? Why? Because the VSD is still unrestricted. So, during systole, the pressure in the LV will be equal to the RV. Mm -hmm. And during systole again, pressure in the aorta will be equal to the pulmonary because the valves are open. So during systole, the pressure in the aorta will be equal to the LV to the RV to the pulmonary artery. So the systolic pressure will still be the same. The systolic pressure will be less in the pulmonary because the valves are closed, so now you depend on resistance. But on the other hand, it's not necessarily about, about pressures, it's about how much flow into that pulmonary artery? And how can we detect that the flow increased? So, essentially, the saturations will increase. So, you use the formula to get to calculate um, flow and pulmonary vascular resistance. So, actually, you measure QPQS before, QPQS after, and estimate, calculate pulmonary vascular resistance. So, you proceed with the repair if the patient has. A pulmonary vascular resistance less than 8 um, uh, wood unit per meter square. 
and with that decreasing with oxygen. Okay. So pulmonary vascular resistance of more than eight wood unit and irreversible. This is prohibited. Pulmonary vascular resistance less than four um, is safe, and anywhere between four and eight is a hazy area. Okay. That is with oxygen. That's with oxygen, yes. After after the reversibility. And uh, measuring QPQS, and you, you find that it is significant. It is. Uh, uh, what are the chances of a patient having a VSD and uh, QPQS is 1.2? So it's the eyes that the VSD is very small, so there is no significant left or right chance. It's actually very small that is not hemodynamically significant, QPQS is, is low. Or on the other hand, the VSD can be very big and the pulmonary vascular resistance is significantly increased so that there is no significant shunting across the VSD. How would you know the difference? By echo, you just see a big VSD. Okay. <laughs> That's very easy. And obviously, measuring pressures and the pressure, the pressure in the right ventricle and the common artery are high, then this is a significant VSD. So, Eisenhower syndrome is contraindication for VSD closure. You detect that by, by patient age, history, um, uh, pulse oximeter, chest X ray, ECG, echo, cardiac cath. If a patient has significant irreversible increase in the pulmonary vascular resistance, then we should not close the VSD. Uh, if the, the, v the resistance is not very high or is reversible, then we proceed with the VSD. So now, at last we have agreed, we need to close that VSD. <laughs> at last. Do we close that VSD by surgery or by cat? <laughs> So, uh, different factors here. Uh, the first factor is the type of the VSD. Okay? So, patients with um, obviously uh, percutaneous closure, so cat closure, <laughs> is a lot less invasive. Okay? And, and patients can go home much earlier without scar, without uh, uh, post operative uh, longer course, of course. But at least the currently available devices that close the VSD um, uh, are not suitable for closure of all types of VSDs. Okay? So, uh, the most common type of VSD that gets closed by CAT is the muscular VSD. They usually get, have a disc so that it rests on the, on the septum. So, that, uh, uh, so if, if that disc interferes with a valve, then it might impair the valve closure or can cause compression and conduction or, or things like that or get m not very stable so uh, again uh, most muscular VSDs get closed by, by cat while on the other hand uh, perimembranous VSD uh, subarterial VSD and inlet VSD are too close to valves so it's very less likely uh, recently some devices are being designed to close other VSDs uh, but this is not yet a standard of care anyway. So for currently, the standard of care is closure of muscular VSDs by cath, while uh, other types by surgery. <laughs> On the other hand, even if there is a muscular VSD, but then um, the continuous closure, the device has to pass through the vessels of the baby. If the baby is too small with a significantly big VSD, the, then you need a big device and then this device um, needs bigger vessels to, to pass into. So the size of the VSD in relation to the size of the baby, again, is, a, is another factor. And obviously, if a patient has any other indication for surgery. So, so if a patient has a, a, a mid-muscular VSD and a fellow, you, you wouldn't just close <laughs> this kind of VSD. <laughs> okay. So that's, that's surgery for the scan. Okay. So if we agreed to, uh, to do surgery, would you just close the VSD or would you do pulmonary artery banding first and then do delayed VSD closure? Okay. Primary VSD closure is, uh, 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 is uh, easy to understand. What is the banding and, and then why would you do a band and then delayed closure? Switch is 
What's, so what's the rationale for doing bands? What would, do, what would the band do? A band is an artificial stenosis on the pulmonary artery. Would you, you just wrap a band, synthetic band, around the pulmonary artery, and you keep narrowing it so that you get less, less flow into the pulmonary artery. And so you, you avoid the very high pulmonary flow and the exposure of the pulmonary vascular bed to high pressure. So you protect the lungs without actually closing the VSD, so you're not actually repairing the cardiac defect, you're just protecting the lungs from the hazardous effects. Yeah, but for this, they protect the lungs, some VSD may be clear than the exomuscular, the high pressure. Okay. So, rationale for doing bands are... Bands, palm artery bending is a, is a much easier operation. Okay? So, uh, usually do that uh, off bypass. You do not need to, to put the patient on cardiopulmonary bypass machine. You do not need to open the heart, work through very small hearts. Mm -hmm. So, it might be easier. <coughs> and then, some VSDs will actually close spontaneously. So, you might not need ever to do anything inside the heart. So, you just do the band, and then when the VSDs close, you remove the band. <laughs> On the other hand, obviously, uh, closing uh, large DSDs in very small babies who, the, who, that have failure to thrive and very small birth weight and then like two and a half or three kilos and very, um, uh, lots of heart failure, that can be a challenge. Okay? But again, most studies have shown that primary DSD closure gets much better results than doing pulmonary artery banding first, then DSD closure. Postoperative management of pulmonary artery banding might be very challenging. And then you need to balance the pulmonary flow, might be the, the pulmonary artery band can be too tight and then the patient gets really, really cyanosed or um, uh, puts a lot of afterload on the heart so that the heart suffers. On the other hand, the pulmonary artery band can be loose. So we think that the pulmonary artery is not protected, while well, they're not. And then the patient comes, comes back with pulmonary vascular disease. So, uh, it, it, it's, it's not an ideal thing. On the other hand, pulmonary artery bands can migrate and then they can cause bifurcation and stenosis in the pulmonary arteries. So, pulmonary artery bands are not without its problems. So, um, that's why primary VSD closure is the standard of care. So, if a patient has a VSD, it's probably better to di just close the VSD. Why would you ever need to do pulmonary artery band? When would it be a better than a primary closure? So if you're not able to close the VSD that early, like if a patient has like five VSDs, and then you might not very well know how to close each of them. So some of them might be able to be closed by cath, others by surgery, but the baby is too small for, for devices, and then some are actually close spontaneously if we wait long enough. But if we wait long enough without protecting the pulmonary circulation, the patient will get heart failure and pulmonary disease. So we need to protect them from that till some of them close spontaneously and the rest will be closed by surgery or care for both. Okay? That gives an example of a patient. Yes, that is patient. Yes. The TGA multiple So VSDs. multiple VSDs. Th this can be a, an option. Maybe patients are Swiss cheese and they never get the VSDs closed. And then they go into a single ventricle pathway. This is the first step in the single ventricle pathway anyway, from yeah. okay. So multiple VSDs that we think are not amenable to closure, uh, primarily. Uh, other patients are, are very low birth weight and in very poor general condition. So there are chest infection, pneumonia, heart failure, chest infection, heart failure, chest infection, heart failure, keep ventilated. And then you do not want to put them on, on cardiopulmonary bypass with active infection and with, with current heart failure and being ventilated and in very uh, uh, poor general condition. So it might just be easier to just open the chest well, They are ventilated anyway, open the chest, put a pulmonary artery band, get them out of this trouble, and then close the VSD with a patient okay. much bigger and uh, better condition. Okay. So again, there is a role for pulmonary artery band, but in very limited situations while the primary closure of the VSD is the recommended way. 
So uh, we go quickly o over a uh, few minutes to, uh, to go through techniques for uh, surgical VSD closure. So this is the surgeon view. Now we're, we're standing from the right side, so the patient is on the operate, uh, operating table. So uh, head, feet, and we're standing from the right side. This is SVC, IVC with, with bypass machine cannula. Now we're, we're incising the right atrium, looking through the right atrium. This is tricuspid valve. This is ventricular septum, and here we see VSD. So if I put my finger here, I will be inside the LV. This is the cusps. Okay? So this is the perimaminous VSD. So we usually close perimaminous VSDs approaching through the right atrium from inside the tricuspid valve orifice. Okay. What is that? Coronary sinus. This is septal leaflet. That's the annulus of the septal leaflet. This would be the tendon of the door. So this is triangular cup. At the apex of the triangular cup, you get the AV node at the floor there. And then the bundle of this will cross through the remnant of the membrane septum into the posterior inferior edge of the VSD. So let, let's first uh, have a cut section there. Take this out and look from here. Something like that. So now this is a right atrium, right ventricle, the casket valve. This is the remnant of the membrane septum. This is the crest of the ventricular septum. This will be the VSD. Here is a wooden cusp. And this is the LV. Okay? So if this is the ventricular septum with the crest of the ventricular septum here with the VSD here. And this is the perimenous VSD with um, po where part of the edge of the defect is formed by the animus of the aortic and the tricuspid valves. Where would you think the where would you think the conduction tissue would be here? <laughs> so we said if you node will be in the floor of the right atrium at the apex of the triangular cup. And then membranes, the bundle of this will cross posterior inferior edge of the VSD. So if this is the AV node bundle of his crossing posterior inferior edge of the VSD. And then dividing into left bundle branch and right bundle branch. Okay? The, the main bundle of this passes like 3-4 millimeters from the crest of the septum and towards the left side. So if this is the crest of the septum, this is left ventricle, this is right ventricle, it will be like 3-4 millimeter from the crest and towards the left side. This is the main bundle of this. How would you get complete heart block? Either injury to the AV node itself, injury to the bundle of this, or quite unlikely, but you can get complete uh, heart block if you injure both right and left bundle branch, uh, which is which is less likely. So we just we try to avoid the main bundle of this because this is very close to the to the to the edge of the defect. What would happen if you get a right bundle branch block? How would that uh, clinically affect the patient? Uh, I mean, I mean, what what happens if a patient gets right bundle branch block? Conduction. Essentially, nothing significant. Okay. So if a patient gets a right bundle branch block, they do not get worse clinical outcome. But they get significantly worse clinical outcome if they get complete heart block. Because then you need to implant a pacemaker, and the pacemaker has their problems. So you can get pacemaker infections, so uh, migrations, perforation. Uh, pacemakers can cause uh, pacemaker-induced cardiomyopathy, which is a really injurious thing. You get... Uh, 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 Weakness of the of the so cardiomyopathy, weakness of the heart muscles. So we tried as, as much as possible to avoid getting complete heart block. <coughs> so now if so, so we want to close the VSD. So we want to put a patch to close that defect. Uh, and we do that by going with sutures through 
the muscle and then putting the patch uh, through it. What happens if we go with the sutures? So this, uh, the, uh, this is like the needle. What happens if we go through the crest of the septum? Like that. You, you injure the main bundle of his. You get complete heart block. But what happens if you do like that? So you go through, so away from the crest of the septum. In the RV side, you go with superficial bites from RV to RV side without going from RV to LV side because otherwise you get injury to the. So if you do that, if you get something, it would be right bundle branch block. You might not get, even get it, but if there is injury to the conduction, it would be a right bundle branch block and not complete hard block. Okay? And that's why. The patch will be towards the right side of the septum, not lying directly on the crest of the septum. Okay? If you see the patch on echo towards the right side of the septum, this is what we actually meant to do, and this is not a, a bad thing. Okay? This is to avoid conduction. So, uh, again, uh, through the, the surgeon view, you start closing the VSD, you go in and out superficial bites on the right side of the septum, you do not cross towards the left side. And then when going towards the posterior inferior corner, you go really far away from the, from the, from the edge. Because if you go really close to the edge, you are very near to the, to the main bundle of this. But then you cross the bundle here. This would be the right bundle branch because this is further away after the main bundle of his has already uh, divided. So if you injure something here, that would be right bundle branch. And then you get, go really away from the posterior inferior edge of the carrion nest VSD. And then when you go higher, <coughs> you go through tricuspid valve annulus. Conduction tissue does not pass through tricuspid valve. Okay? It has to, to pass through muscle because this is specialized uh, muscle fibers. So um, tricuspid valve itself is safe. Still, you do not want to, um, to uh, cause tricuspid regurge or, or injure the tricuspid valve, or obviously not aortic valve, but then if you pass through tricuspid valve annulus, you should be safe. So, uh, this is a, a VSD. These are tricuspid valve cusps, and this is the patch. They close that with, with interrupted sutures, which is an option. And then you go all around to close the PSD. <coughs> Sometimes you get um, a tricuspid valve with lots lots of cords crossing the VSD, where the visualization of the v itself, uh, VSD itself gets really difficult. So in such limited cases, you can incise the tricuspid valve itself and reflect it, so detach the tricuspid valve from its annulus, expose the VSD, you get a much better exposure, and then you close the VSD. Okay? Uh, we do not do that routinely because um, uh, um, there's a risk of, of uh, the hastiness of this uh, of this uh, uh, reattachment of the tricuspid valve, and then patients can come with a massive tricuspid regurgitation. So uh, this is a, a, a technique that can be used, but should not be used as as a routine. And then you uh, you close the VSD and then uh, reattach the tricuspid valve. So patients with subarterial VSD, so these are VSDs just below the pulmonary and aortic valve annulus. Okay? We usually approach that through pulmonary artery. So here we're opening pulmonary artery. These are the three cusps of the pulmonary valve. Okay? The VSD is just beneath it. So close the VSD uh, uh, from below uh, at the muscle. While at the upper edge, this is just the continuity between the annulus of the aortic and pulmonary valve. So we go through pulmonary valve annulus. Sometimes we too, you see like um, a white tissue here, like uh, that's a fibrous tissue that I want to strengthen my sutures with. These are aortic cusps. If you see anything white here, that would be aortic cusps. You should not take any sutures. Injury to aortic cusps can be very easy uh, closing the subarthy APS. So, what's the anchor? What do you use to anchor the patch? 
so, so from from in the subarachnoid VSD from below, you take stitches into the muscle, mm -hmm. while above you go in and out through the the pulmonary crust at the site of the attachment mm -hmm. to the wall. So here again, I'm close, uh, closing subarachnoid VSD um, through opening the pulmonary artery. These are uh, pulmonary valve cusps, and then the VSD patch is what we just beneath it, and then upper sutures are taken inside the cusp. So we surgery, uh, we surgeons do uh, good, but what can happen? <laughs> Closing a VSD. So you can distort the cuspid valve. You can get significant recuspid urge. You can injure um, aortic valve crusts, and then you can get severe aortic regurg. This is totally unacceptable. Patient can get acute severe aortic regurg. If patients get this, you have to go back, take out the patch, and check that the aortic crusts are good, or anything, any repair needs to, do, uh, to be done to the, to the crusts. Uh, the best thing is to avoid doing that. Aortic crusts are just uh, at the annulus of the track. Of the track. And the hard block, again, uh, we keep saying that we know the sites of the conduction, that uh, uh, hard block is, is a risk. Uh, so let's assume that uh, this is a patient who has a big, uh, big VSD. So this is a water, this is pulmonary LVR. So if you close the VSD like that, okay, to the crest of the septum, so again, risk of causing a hard block is high. Mm -hmm. But have a look on the LVOT. No, okay. On the other hand, if you close the VSD towards the right ventricle, mm -hmm. LVOT will be much wider. Yeah. So patients can get LVOT obstruction mm -hmm. by taking the stitches mm -hmm. too near to the crest of the septum, towards the left side. Mm -hmm. Or actually, if, pay, uh, if uh, the VSDs if a large VSD was closed directly, so you get real narrowing of the... Mm -hmm. VSDs can be closed directly by direct switches without putting a patch. Mm -hmm. You can do that if the VSD is really small. If it is big, it can cause significant LVT obstruction. So do not forget to check for LVT obstruction uh, after surgery. So uh, uh, surgical results. Uh, early on, uh, hospital mortality is really low. So patients with isolated VSD, uh, uh, mortality approaches uh, 0%. While patients with very small uh, weight, uh, mortality might be still a bit higher, still less than uh, 5%. Um, on the other hand, patients with high pulmonary vascular disease have higher complications than hospital stay. These are not Isimengel. These are patients with higher pulmonary vascular disease, and then we check that they are not, they do not have irreversible increase in pulmonary vascular disease. Okay? So these are not Eisenmenger, but still have higher uh, pulmonary vascular resistance. They get, um, so this should not increase mortality, but uh, can get higher complications and uh, longer hospital stay. They, they can get a pulmonary hypertensive crisis. So what is a pulmonary hypertensive crisis? Okay. So, yeah. So th this, this usually happens with patients. Long-standing severe pulmonary hypertension, and then after the closure, after surgery, usually by a day or two, and then they get acute severe attack of pulmonary vascular constriction. Okay. So if a patient have the VSD closed, and then they suddenly they, they, they are not as huh? the baseline pulmonary vascular resistance is low, but they had long-standing high pulmonary pressure because of the, the big VSD. Uh, this can occur with other causes for pulmonary potential, like they can occur with truncuses, can occur with the AV canals, things like that. Long-standing, so patients who had late repair of their lesions that caused uh, severe pulmonary hypertension. So again, after the VSD closure, the baseline pulmonary, pulmonary pressure is, is acceptable, is low, but then they get acute severe attack of pulmonary vascular constrictions. And then with the VSD closed, the RV would suddenly face a huge resistance. And then can very well fail. What happens if the right ventricle fails? 
how will the patient present? Look at the output. Uh, how, uh, how would you get a central cyanosis? What causes central cyanosis? So low pulmonary flow per se does not cause cyanosis. What actually causes cyanosis is deoxygenated blood going into the aorta. Okay. This can be secondary to low pulmonary flow with a big shunt. Mm -hmm. But if there is no shunt, mm -hmm. there will be significant amount of deoxygenated blood going to the aorta. Mm -hmm. What comes back from the lungs will be oxygenated. There is no problem with air, uh, uh, with exchange, gas exchange and, and ventilation. The problem is that the amount of blood coming back from the lung is actually very low. Mm -hmm. So there, is, there will be low cardiac output. Mm -hmm. This can be very serious. Patients die from common intensive crisis. Okay? So patient in ICU, uh, um, at one or two days postoperatively, and then acutely uh, low cardiac output, low blood pressure, um, uh, 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 no urine output, acidosis, high lactate. You, you get echo and then you find that the RV pressure is really high and uh, the RV contractility is getting low. So what would you do? You sedate them. You sedate ventilate. So you, you, the patient is not ventilated, you ventilate him. Pa uh, sedate and paralyze. You give pulmonary vasodilators. What are pulmonary vasodilators? If you have to access to nitric oxide, you should give that. Otherwise, you give what, uh, pulmonary vasodilators like medrinone. You can give sildenafil in the right, right tube, NG tube. Uh, how would you manage ventilation to let to get the, the pulmonary vascular resistance lower? So what are the, the ventilator um, uh, uh, maneuvers to get pulmonary vascular dilatation? Increase the FiO2, increase the oxygen is potent, potent by vascular dilator. And decrease the how, how about the CO2? What does the CO2 do, do to the pulmonary uh, circulation? Vasoconstriction, so opposite of, uh, of oxygen. And uh, acid-base balance? So you, make it more you want to make it more alkalotic, so uh, increasing FiO2, washing out CO2 mm -hmm. and alkalosis causes pulmonary vasodilatation. So you essentially hyperventilate with 100% oxygen. You wash out CO2, you cause, you cause alkalosis, and you increase the FI2. Okay? Uh, obviously, you might need to put uh, patients on, uh, on inotropes, and you might end up putting a patient on ECMO for a few days. Uh, quite unlikely, but then uh, this pulmonary test crisis usually occurs within a few days and then stops. The patients do not get pulmonary test crisis at home. Okay? That's a usually an, a, an early post operative event. Again, a lot more frequent with patients having late repair. Uh, so, uh, after VSD closure, heart block can occur in like 0.5 to 3% of cases. Uh, right band branch block can occur in like majority of cases, but this has no um, uh, recorded clinical significance. <coughs> you remember when we talked about association with VSDs? We said a patient can get a VSD and so cirrhotic membrane. So uh, we close the VSD usually from the right atrium, and then uh, you, you go on the right side of the septum. This can cause the right bone branch block, but this is not significant. Okay, no problem. Uh, resection of subaortic membrane, you can do that. Mostly we do that through the aortic valve. So you open a sending aorta and access the LVOT. Take out the the subaortic membrane. Subaortic membrane is one of the lesions that have a, a significant incidence of recurrence. Yes. So subaortic membrane can recur. So uh, to decrease the incidence of recurrence, we usually do septal myectomy. So after taking out the the, the fibrous ridge, we cut out a bit of muscle from the LVOT. This is exactly where the left bundle branch passes. And so, again, so patients with isolated subaortic membrane get a resection of subaortic membrane and septal they come out of theater with left bundle branch block 
this is not significant. This is much better than getting recurrence. Yeah. Okay. Well, on the other hand, <laughs> patients with DSD closure can get right button branch block. Again, this is not significant. Yeah. If you, you get both, both, you get complete heart block. If you get both RBB, I think. <laughs> you, if you get right button branch block and left button branch block, although the main bundle of this is intact, mm -hmm. there is no conduction from atrium to ventral. You get complete heart block. Patients with VSD and subaortic membrane get VSD closure, resection of subaortic membrane without septal myectomy. Do not do septal myectomy in patients with VSD closure at the same time. Okay? Yes. But we do septal myectomy and how come we do septal This is exactly what happens with the uh, patients with Holcomb. Who have a previous uh, alcohol septal ablation? Alcohol septal ablation causes right bundle branch block, mm -hmm. while septal myotomy causes left bundle branch block, and then you frequently get complete heart block uh, <laughs> in surgery after alcohol ablation. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, some patients might get uh, residual VSD. This is a bit uncommon. Uh, small residual VSDs usually close spontaneously or become very restrictive so that they are not clinically significant. But patients with significant residual VSD should have their VSDs closed. When? So, uh, once you diagnose them, early after surgery. So we, we do a uh, transphagial echo in, in nearly all patients, unless they are too small to put them. Uh, oh, if probe. you're still in the OR. If you're still in the OR, you, go back. You, go, you, uh, you, you detect uh, residual VSD, like four millimeter or bigger, you go back on bypass, you check that VSD and close it. If the patient is in ICU and has a significant residual VSD, like 5 millimeters or more, yeah, like 4, 4 millimeters or, or more, you get them back, second day of operation, and you close the VSD. Yeah. Patients with significant residual VSD should not go out of hospital with the disease. Okay? If you discover it, max after. Okay. Then you start. Actually, he sense have to, to get the VSD closed. But if there is a, 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 there is a small VSD, you start as a... So if you discover that late after operation, you start uh, and get, uh, going through the list of indications from the start. But early on, patients should get the VSD closed. Uh, we do routine echo in theatre, and we do, we do routine echo in the ICU. Patients with significant VSDs should get the VSD closed. On the other hand, patients with a small VSD like one or two millimeters, this usually close spontaneously. Yeah, but there was a patient in the ICU where there is the VSD, but you didn't close it. So uh, still, that's, yeah. a, that's an option. Yeah. Um, finding the VSD can be, uh, can be very challenging because then it's not like a, a, a has an anatomical landmark. If it's a premium VSD, you know where to look for. If it's a subarterial <laughs> VSD, but if the residual VSD, it's relation to the to the in relation to the patch mm -hmm. and to other valves. So you have to go through different echo views so that you can localize where to look for. It can be tricky to find. So late results after the VSD closure. So patients who, who had early VSD closure, like within first two years of life. Um, they get full functional capacity and almost normal life expectancy. Um, patients with normal um, uh, pulmonary vascular resistance, so again, patients who had their VSDs closed early on, uh, th there is no reported lead deaths in these patients. Um, on the other hand, <coughs> patients who went to, uh, to surgery with high pulmonary vascular resistance, they can have one of three outcomes. So some of patients uh, can get regression of the pulmonary vascular resistance and the pulmonary pressure drops after surgery. Others may get stable pulmonary, uh, uh, pulmonary artery pressure. It can still be high. It can even get higher. So pulmonary vascular disease can even progress later, later after surgery. We do not know which patient will go to which direction. So patients who are still reactive and don't have irreversible increase in pulmonary vascular disease, uh, so we still close the VSDs, knowing that their outcome is not as good as the ones who have their VSDs closed early. Um, patients with high mortality uh, are the ones who had their VSDs closed late, and uh, if the pulmonary vascular resistance was higher than seven uh, wood unit per meter square, 
and patients who had uh, transient or permanent complete heart block early on um, after, after surgery. So let's assume a patient had the VSD closure, came out of theater with a complete heart block. Would you go next day put a, a, a pacemaker? For 14 days. Okay, some, some of these patients can get the, the heart block not because a permanent injury into the bundle of his itself. It can be because the stitches were very near to the conduction and so these stitches had the tissue edema and then the edema caused compression and dysfunction of the... So this can be just dysfunction which actually recovers after uh, a few days. So usually wait for like 14 days before closing the... Uh, be before inserting the pacemaker. So if a patient, a pa a patient uh, gets his rhythm back uh, to one-to-one -one conduction, then they do not get the pacemaker implanted. If they do not recover, then they get the pacemaker implanted. Now I'm talking about a patient who had an initial complete heart block and stayed for a few days, five, six days, and then the normal conduction uh, recovered. Then we sent him out of hospital without a pacemaker. These patients have higher than higher mortality than others because they can get late complete heart block and if they do not have escape rhythm, they can get some death. So then we put pacemakers in everybody. And any patient who gets a, a heart block just gets a pacemaker second day. Again, pacemakers are not without its problems. So pacemaker pocket infection, pacemaker infection leading to carditis, sleep perforation, uh, pacemaker induced cardiomyopathy, so, so again, patients who recover their normal conduction, we do not implant pacemakers, knowing that they are higher risk than others. So follow them up with the Follow them up and then if they are symptomatic, you do both cards and things like that. So that was it. We talked about Incidence of VSD. VSD is a really common disease. I've gone through normal anatomy, types of VSDs, pathophysiology of left right chunks, and the Eisenmenger syndrome. Um, talk today about common associations, essentially either pre existing associations or um, sequelae secondary to the, to the VSDs. Uh, talked about natural history, can be a really benign disease with, with lots of VSDs closing spontaneously, can be very um, uh, uh, difficult disease with. Uh, heart failure, high mortality, and uh, uh, Eisenmenger syndrome. Uh, talk about indications for surgery, so depending on the amount of shunt or the association of complications. Talk about timing with the unrestricted VSD, three to six months, uh, restricted VSD with three years, unless there is an associated or the cusp prolapse or regurge, you just close them. Contraindications, irreversible pulmonary vascular disease. Um, talked about surgery or cath and talked about um, primary uh, VSD closure or uh, pulmonary artery banding uh, techniques for VSD closure and early and late results after the VSD. Any questions? Yes. yes, yes. Oh, yeah. significant difference. The significant difference can occur in inlet VSDs if they are associated with AB canals. But otherwise, uh, does the muscular VSD cause more uh, pulmonary vascular disease than perimenous VSD? Just depending on the size of the shunt and the amount of flow and, and the pulmonary pressure. But not necessarily the, the type of the VSD because it doesn't make that difference. It makes a difference if the patient is a, is a Down syndrome and then this can get uh, much quicker but not necessarily on the plate. I've seen about uh, two or three children in my country. That's why I asked that. Uh, who had muscular VSDs, closer elements, with others who had membranous VSDs. They tend to, when you do echo, you would see blue flow. <laughs> Again, it depends on the, on the size. Uh, muscular VSD, if they are big enough or if they are multiple, then they, they cause bigger shunt and then they so it's, it's depending on the size of the shunt rather than the type of the VSD itself for the development of pharmaceuticals.
Any other questions? Yes, if, if we apply that uh, in Thursday's case, the PSD case, it's like 20 or 30 years. What was the indication, indication of this? So that, that patient was a really unusual case. So he was uh, 47 years with a BSD that had a gradient across it of 60. So his blood pressure was 120, while the, the, the cumulative pressure was 60. Um, on, 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 uh, the LV was dilated, patient was symptomatic. We know that the cumulative pressure is significantly less than the water pressure because the gradient was 70. And uh, dead calf and pulmonary vascular resistance dropped with oxygen and the QPQS was more than 3. Again, this is very, very unusual case. Okay? But uh, you, ca you can still uh, get such patients. So, uh, if in doubt, just do a cath. Do not just label them as a manga without making sure because from time to time you get surprises. Any questions? Thank you.